So we started with dynamic memory allocation and, and, and talked about it to, to see actually, uh, kind of review it and see how it actually works. And what we said about dynamic memory allocation was the fact that when we are doing that, when we are doing uh, regular programming and we do uh, memory allocation, statically allocated memory is the memory that is essentially called automatic variables too. They call it automatic because they get created automatically and they get destroyed automatically. Um, these are called statically allocated memory. This array over here is statically allocated, which means the body of the array and the name that is the pointer that points to the array, they're both inside your executable. The executable comes into memory, it dies, goes away. The data and memory and everything goes away with it. You don't need to worry about anything. It is automatic. We said that we, uh, this is uh, good because it doesn't create any bugs or leaks or any leaks or anything like that. The, the major problem with these things is that you have to decide what the size of your memory is when you are writing the code. You cannot know what the user wants. You cannot ask the user how many numbers do you have and allocate memory that much you want. Or if the data grew while the program was running, you had no way to resize the memory and make it bigger or smaller or anything like that. Because of that fact, we need to be able to do the memory allocation at runtime when the program is running. We write the program, we compile, we have the executable, the code is gone, the source code is on, and everything is gone. We only have an executable. Executable runs, and that executable should decide what the size of the memory is. We call that dynamically allocated memory, and the dynamically allocated memory works exactly like regular automatic variables that you have. The only difference is that the executable, in the executable program, you only have the handle of the memory that you have, which is essentially the pointer. You have a pointer, that pointer points to the piece of memory in which you want to put the stuff. You can decide how big or small is going to be, you can change the values and everything like that. We said because of the problem, because of what we have done over here, the full power of computers is on our hand, our executables are small, and it occupies memory outside of the execution area, which makes the program faster, and use of the memory more efficient. But, again, as we mentioned, with power comes responsibility, which means by doing that, if we forget to deallocate the memory when the program is finished, the only thing that is automatic is the pointer, not the array itself. Therefore, the pointer gets deallocated and the rest remains in memory. And we stopped right there, correct? That's how far, that's, okay. So, but now we want to see, now that we know how it works, we want to see what are the problems with dynamic memory allocation and what are the things we need to actually pay attention to. There are certain rules that you have to follow with dynamic memory allocation obsessively. Dynamic memory allocation is an extremely powerful thing but needs to be used with caution and uh, attention. It's exactly like having a gun. It's a very good thing to have for protection, whatever it is, but you can shoot yourself. 70% you shoot yourself than someone else. That's what it is. That's what a gun is. Unless you follow the rules of carrying and handling that thing step by step, religiously and obsessively. Same thing with this one. If you just use it, it's going to shoot you in the foot. You have to follow the rules precisely. Rule number one, when you create a pointer for dynamic memory allocation, do not use it until you actually do dynamic memory allocation. If you just use the pointer and you think it's going to happen automatically, it's not going to happen. Because that pointer has some garbage value in it, and garbage value is an address. What is an address in, the, in a computer? What is, when we say an address, what does it mean? Location of the byte. What is the type of the location of the byte? What type of a thing it is? Do you know that? No, location of a byte. But I said, what is an address? She said, he, she, my apologies. He said, location of a byte in memory. No, no, what is the address? The byte is in memory. It is a... What is in a pointer? An address. What is the address? What is the type of the address? It's a number. What type of a number? 
Pardon me? Is there anything other than binary in computer science? Anything, really, like, the, what is the type? It's binary of everything. Is, anything is binary. But what is the type of that address? That's binary. Up to, down to this point, it was beautiful. We said that address is a location of a byte in memory. And we came to the conclusion that location of a byte in, a gum, in, a, in the memory is a number. Now I'm asking what type of a number? Is it a double? Is it a floating point number? What type of a number? What type of a number? What type of an integer? Can minus 52 be location of a byte in memory? No. So what type of a number you think it is? It is an integer. And we know it's an integer. It cannot be minus 5. An integer cannot, that cannot be minus is an unsigned integer. It's an unsigned. You don't know what's an unsigned integer? IPC 144. It is an IPC 144 concept, an unsigned. OK, an unsigned integer of any type is an integer that is only positive. How many fingers? Can you say this? How many fingers? 10. If I start from 0, how far I can go? Who said 10? I have 11 fingers? <laughs> right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Correct? Now, I have 10 fingers, right? With this, I want to show negative numbers, too. What is the smallest thing I can show? I just said I want to show negative numbers too. What is the smallest thing? Minus? Nine. Then it's going to be minus 9, minus 8, minus 7, minus 6, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0. Then what happened to positive ones? I want to show them both. With these 10 fingers, how, what are the range of numbers that I can do? Positive and negative. Seriously, I have 10 fingers. This is like kindergarten question. From, from negative 9 to 9, I need 19 fingers. That is very creepy. Minus 5, yes. Minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I have one small, one, uh, my positive ones are one less than negative ones. That's the same thing with integers. When integers, you have, let's say for a byte, a byte is an integer, a character is an integer, right? 0 to 255, correct? If you want to show unsigned, if you want to show sign, it's from minus 128 to positive 127. Same thing with short integer, same thing with any type of integer. For unsigned, you have bigger numbers. Do we understand what unsigns are? OK, how do you create an unsigned variable? You write unsigned in front of it. Instead of integer a, you write unsigned integer a. Now that a cannot accept negatives anymore. If you put minus 1 in here, in there, it becomes the biggest number you've ever seen. It doesn't accept negative numbers. Addresses are of such type. Addresses are a special type of unsigned integer. But nevertheless, it's just an integer. It's a number. An address is not a magical thing that you put in a pointer and some wizard comes, poof, and something goes so. It's just a sequence number. If I told you, what is the address of this finger? You say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The address of this finger is 6. 6 is a number. What is the address of that chair? 0, 1, 2, 2, and 3. That's the address of this. What is the address of byte? From 0 goes up to, they count the bytes one by one in memory and goes up to whatever you can go. That's what an address is. And pointers are nothing but regular numbers. When you say put regular variables, when you say type asterisk m data, you're, it means type pointer m data. It means m data is an integer. M data is an integer. What is that integer? Address, address of some byte in memory from which 
that type begins. So if I have an employee, an employee's 100 bytes, and I have a pointer of an employee with a number in it 300, it means at, at address 300 in memory, next 100 bytes is an employee. Got it? Are we okay with this? So not, a pointer is nothing but a regular integer, nothing but a special integer. But they, nevertheless, they are integers. Therefore, when you create a pointer and you don't initialize it in it, initialize it, there is garbage in there. It is a bit pattern. Nevertheless, it's a number. That number doesn't belong to you. That's an address, sequence number of a byte, somewhere in memory that doesn't belong to you. If you write in it, poof, computer explodes, which means segmentation fault and so on and so forth, right? Do we understand it now? That's first mistake. You never, ever use a pointer that is not set, either set to null or set to a valid address of memory. I have to show you something. <clears throat> and I really, really, really ask you if you want to be successful in this subject to do it. Another thing like workshop zero that I want you to do. Go to the repository that I have my notes in there. You know where they are, right? This one says OP244, yada, yada. You see that? Okay. In here, if you, if you come over here, you see what does it say? IPC144. Review session for OP244 and 200 students. Part one, part two, and the code. One semester, when I started semester, this happened. And in one weekend, I taught the whole IPC144 to all OP244 students. OK? That's the recording of it. OK? And it's around nine hours, so we started from like 8 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, and we went all the way to 6 o'clock in the afternoon, okay? And I went through all IPC 144 with coding and everything. Set a weekend, sleep well at night, wake up in the morning, put that recording, open up the code, and follow it. You need to understand C++ C properly to do C++ correctly, okay? Please. Those are all, these are the recordings for it, and those are all the code I have written over there. So if you click on it, every single code that I have, that I'm talking about over there, they are all there. You see that? Hello. And it, it keeps going right to the end with structures and everything, files and everything. Two-dimensional arrays. I started from the beginning, reviewed everything right to the end. Please go through it. Okay? It's a crash course of IPC 144. Got it? Please do so. Please, please, please. OK. So that's number one for problem with pointers. Number two, there is a golden rule about creating pointers. At any moment that you have a pointer and that pointer is unused, that pointer is fresh or unused, you have to set it to null. That's a golden rule of dynamic memory allocation. Any pointer you are not using or it's not pointing to somewhere, you put null in it. Why? It is a safe empty status for a pointer. A pointer that is null is recognizable that is not pointing to anything. So if a pointer is not used, set it to null. However, if you set it to null and use it immediately because it's pointing to null, still it will crash your program with a null pointer assignment. But it's recognizable, so you can do an if statement to see if the pointer is setting to something, pointing to something or not. Null is very important because the delete statement recognizes null, and if you try to null the, delete a null pointer, it will not do anything. It will not crash. Nothing will go wrong with it. It will just ignore it. So if you follow the rule of setting a pointer to null when you are not losing, when you are not using it, it is always safe to use the delete command to wipe the memory. Because if it's null, nothing happens. If it's not null, the memory gets deleted. Number three.
always stay within the size of the memory you allocate and keep track of that size. It is extremely important to always stay within the memory that you are allocating and always keep track of that size. I have a size seven over here, so zero to six is where I go. If I put something in the seventh one, it means it's going to actually go to eighth one, you know? Remember? Zero to nine for ten fingers. It's the same thing. If I put seven, I go out and it's segmentation fault. Always stay within the limits. Extremely important. You, you, this, you are lucky if it actually crashes. You are lucky. The worst case is that you do like this, you go one extra and it doesn't crash. You know when it's going to crash? Seven years later when you're on vacation. That's when it's going to crash. You are lucky if it crashes immediately. So you have to be extremely careful about it. Always, 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 always make sure that you check to see if something is actually pointing to something or not before you want to actually allocate memory into it. If you start allocating just in a, in a pointer that is already pointing to somewhere, you're going to cause memory leak. Why? Because as soon as you set it to, a, to the new address, the old address becomes lost. And those seven bytes over there remains in memory forever. And what did I say forever means? Until you reboot. Okay? So you've got to be careful about that. That causes memory leak. So what you need to do really is... Wait a minute. Why is it... Uh, yeah. So what you really need to do uh, is to make sure that the data is always set... Your pointer is always set to, to null, and you always keep track of the size. So when that's null, obviously size is zero. And you make sure that when you allocate memory, you keep the size updated exactly to what you want, and you delete the way you allocate it, which means If you say integer pointer p is set to new int 100, you delete that with square brackets. If you create a pointer that only points to one entity, then you delete it that way. The way you allocate, that's how you deallocate. If you don't do that, either it's going to crash or it's going to cause memory leak. We're going to see it. So if when you're allocating using square brackets, you are deleting using square brackets. When you're allocating using without square brackets as a single entity, then you delete a single entity. After you delete something, you always set it back to null. At the moment, because we are rookies, because we are rookies, do that anyway. As soon as you delete, set it to null, no matter where, until you find out where it, you do not need to set it to null. Setting it to null won't hurt, but at the moment, will just save you of unwanted memory leak and uh, crashes through the dynamic memory allocation. So set it to null until you master it and you know when you don't need to set it to null. Okay? Give you an example. When you are in a destructor and you delete something, you don't need to set that pointer to null. Why? Because the object is being destroyed. Who cares if it's null or not? Right? I have an attribute inside the class. It is pointing to something. I deleted the thing. Now the object's got to get destroyed. Who cares if it's null or not? For now, just set it to null. It won't hurt. You may see me telling you it wasn't necessary to 
to make it now. Don't think that's an error. It's just something for you to know. And for all those people who don't listen, you better master dynamic memory allocation because later on it's going to come back and hit you because I see many people are just wandering in their computers and stuff. So if you delete, if you allocate with square bracket and delete without square bracket, you are only deleting the first element. The rest becomes memory leak. Careful, don't do that. When you want to delete something, if the data is important inside the deleted, what you want to delete, check to see if the data is not now. Do whatever business you are supposed to do with that data. You want to save it, you want to print it, you want to do something with it. Okay? So that's how you check. And after that, free the memory. Freeing memory, you don't need to check to see if it's null or not. Just delete. Delete automatically does that in its belly. You don't need to do that. But if you need to do something with that memory you are deleting, do it before you delete. And then do another dynamic memory allocation if needed. Then you can reuse memory, memory with new size and do whatever you want to do. And you always stay, the width, stay within the limits of your, uh, of your allocation and you will be fine. So are we okay down to this point? So how do we, how do we resize memory? Resizing memory is again something that you, there's specific sets of rules that you have to follow. When you have a pointer pointing to a piece of memory and you want to resize it, the very first step that you do is to create a temporary pointer of the same type and get the, uh, the memory, allocate the amount of memory in that temporary thing, either bigger or smaller. If you want to resize it, make it bigger, bigger. If you want to make it smaller, make it smaller. After you do the temporary memory, after you do the temporary memory, you make sure everything from the old one is moved to the new one. So you get copy everything from the old one. You copy all of them if you are making it bigger, or you copy only the first ones if you are making it smaller. But nevertheless, you do the copying. After doing the copying, you can just wipe out the data because the data is not needed and you have it in a new, new place, right? After doing that, you have to make sure that the size of the memory is updated to the value that you have. That is 14 at the moment. Now that you have the size set, you have the memory set resized with all the data, now you can make the old data point to the new one. So you get the address inside temp and you put it in M data. So M data, that is your pointer that you want to hold the data, will point to that memory. All these things are done in a function, correct? So that temp and the size and all those things, they are automatic variables. After the function is over, that temporary pointer and everything will be gone, and what is left is the resized memory for you. So the memory is resized. Follow these steps, you have absolutely no problem in resizing memory. Are we good? Are we okay? Yes, sir. There are the extra spaces you needed. I don't know. You re you resized it for a reason. I don't know what you want to use it for. See. I don't know. I have a room and I want a bigger room, right? I get, all, I get all my stuff from the old room and put it in a bigger room. And your question is, what are you going to do with the extra space now? I don't know. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> I don't know. You have extra space. For some reason, you wanted a bigger room, right? I put this extra space. I don't know. You want to put an extra desk? Whatever, okay? I don't know what you're going to do with that, but that's just resizing memory. All right? Now... I assume we all know about classes with resources, right? When we are dealing with classes with resources, everybody's looking at me as I'm talking in some foreign language. Classes with resources, remember copy constructors, copy assignment? Yeah, okay, what are the rule of three? Rule of three. What are the rule of three? 
No, rule of three. Rule of, do, there are specific things we call it rule of three. Anyone knows? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Destructor. There you go. These are rule of three. Why do we, when do we need rule of three? When do we need to apply rule of three to a class? When do we need to? Way do we re when, it, when it is required, to, uh, you don't need to apply rule of, you don't need to have a destructor in the class. You don't need to have a copy constructor. You don't need to have a copy assignment. When do we need it? When is it required? Not necessarily. Huh? That's the name of assignment operator. That's the name of copy assignment. Another name for copy assignment means deep copying. You all know the answer, but I want you to properly say it because when you are going to an interview and you want your ask question, you need to answer it professionally. When do you need rule of three to be applied? When you have a class that has resources outside of its scope. Otherwise, maybe you have dynamic memory allocation in a function, who cares? If I have a dynamic memory allocation in the attributes of the class, then that's a class with a resource outside of its scope. OK, the difference between a class with scope and out, without scope is this. If I just walk into this class like this, I'm a class without a resource. When I go out, I just go out. I don't need to think about anything. I take my body, go out, and life is beautiful. Everything comes with me. But if I'm coming in with a backpack, now I'm a student with a resource. I'm coming in. That resource is not part of me. When I'm going out, I have to take that with me. I have to do deep copying. I have to do deep assignment. Or if I don't want it, I have to throw it away. I cannot leave it here. That's deep copying. When you have property outside of your scope, it means whatever you want to do to yourself, you have to do your property. Got it? It's like when you are moving to another city, you have to take your car with you. Otherwise, the car won't follow you. You have to take it with you, right? If you are immigrating to a new country, you have to get your money to the new country. Otherwise, it won't come with you, <laughs> right? That's copy assignment, deep assignment. Okay, deep copying, shallow. Shallow copying, it means me walking. Deep copying, it means I take care of my stuff, but I'm going around, all right? So that's what it was. So so to, I, wanted to, I want to show you why do we need it. So So when you have a class with resources outside of it, it looks like something like this. I have data class A that has some data outside of it and the size is seven, right? And I have another type, another uh, instance of the data class and it has data and it's only three and it has it over there. Are we good? Now, if I do assignment, if I set A, if I make A equal to B, if I do something like that, what happens? Compiler is not aware that you have resources outside of it. It simply copies everything from one to another, correct? Therefore, the contents inside the class will be copied. And as soon as that happens, you will see that M data is going to point to that one, 7 is going to be over here, and the memory that poor B had becomes orphaned. It becomes memory leak. And then the destructor destroys the thing, goes out, and now the second one wants to destroy. But the memory is already destroyed. Take a look. This was the memory, right? When the destructor of the first one is called, it wipes the memory out with it. Second one doesn't know that that memory is gone. When the destructor of that one is called, it crashes. So with copy assign with assignment done between classes that have resources outside of you have two problems. Problem number one. Memory leak, problem number two, crash when the destructor is called. That's with copy assignment. 
That's why we need copy assignment. Bad copying. Now, bad assignment is happening only when you are assigning something. Bad copying is a hidden thing. It's the son of a gun. The thing happens when you do not expect it. So when you have two classes, when you have a class, sorry, when you have a class and you want to create a class and make out of this class, so make a copy of a class, what you do, there are two other, two different ways to do it. Either you put assignment at the moment of creation or you put parentheses. They are identical. Are we okay with this? Or through new, let me add this one too actually. Any of these will do. So when I make a copy of one class to another, this is what happens. Either this, so in, in any case, B is a copy of A, right? Same scenario happens. Compiler doesn't know that A had some resources outside of it. What it copies is only the guts of uh, A uh, by itself. And therefore, what happens is that they both copy, point to the same thing. The program will actually run perfectly. You would think that everything is copied and everything's nice, but as soon as the objects start going out of the scope, one deletes the data and the other one crashes. That's the good one. Problem is here. Take a look. What's going on here? Ugh. Problem in this, so this is, I'm going to say A, delete, what the devil, <laughs> jumped, <laughs> what did I do, uh, there you go, delete, so that's deleting the same way, now, whoa, everything's gone, where is it? How a function is called in C language, when I say C, it means C++, they're the same. If I have something like this, void foo integer a, whatever, and I have over here integer b, and I say foo b. What happens behind the scene is this. So when foo is called, foo is called like this. Void foo int a is equal to b. That's how it's called. So, and that's why the arguments get the value of the, the, the arguments inside the function get the values passed to it. They become, they get initialized by the value that is being passed to them. This is what happens behind the scene. This was a copy constructor, correct? Assignment at the moment of creation. And that's exactly what happens. If you are passing an object by value, ladies and gents, that's what happens. So you have a class like that. Then you have a function that passes something by value. You call the function, you're getting the data class B over there, and it's being set to A, correct? When you are passing A to that one, B initializes to A, therefore B becomes a copy of A. Same thing happens over there, exactly the same way. Again, a copying happens behind the scene without you knowing it. And when the function foo is done, B gets destroyed, taking the data away with it. A remains without a data. When it gets destroyed, it crashes. Worst one. I have a question. Let's say I write a function like this, int get int, int val, c in val, return back. 
you know what C get int is doing, right? Get int is getting an integer and returning it, right? So what happens at line 19 when I do B is set to get int? Can anybody tell me? Actually, the next person. Who's the next person? I went right down to, I think, the lady over there. Does she listen? She doesn't. Are you, you want to you, you answer? OK, you tell me. What does get int do over there? Can you tell me quickly? Get the, gets the value from the console and puts it in B, correct? Are we all OK with this? OK, my question is that isn't val at line 9 a local variable in the get int function? It is, right? So how can it return its value out to something else? When get int is done, val is dead. How? How can it return a value of something that just died? It's like there is a line over here that I'm not allowed to cross. How can I give you a cup of coffee when I cannot pass the line? How does it do it? Hmm? How does it pass it? No? It creates a temporary nameless copy of the value and keeps it at line 19. So at line 19, that assignment creates a temporary copy out of the val and val dies. That temporary nameless copy is standing in the air. Assignment between B and temporary nameless happens and then nameless dies. So every time you are returning something by value without you knowing, a temporary nameless object gets copied and deleted. And that causes this problem. So you have one class, and as you see that data class foo thingy is creating a data class does whatever and then returns it. By, by, by doing the return, a nameless copy out of A gets created and is returned. So that copy, nameless copy that you see, becomes a shallow copy of, the, of A and will not carry its, uh, uh, and it, it will not create a new uh, memory. So it will actually point to that. So when the function is over and the line is over, that nameless dies. Actually, this is wrong. The destructor, oh yeah, sorry. A gets deleted over here. When A gets deleted, it deletes its data with it. So that nameless that we thought it has uh, some data, it doesn't have anymore. First of all, your assignment will be assigned to something garbage. B will have garbage in it. And then after that, they will both crash. B and the nameless. Nameless tries to, because nameless dies exactly at this line. At this line, that crashes. Then it comes to the end of main, and B crashes. That's why we need copy constructor and copy assignment. And how do we do that? Good copying. How do we do good copying? We do it like this. So when we want copying to be done, the very first thing we do, we measure the size of the data that the one that we want to copy, and we allocate memory for it. Or we do whatever is needed to make a dynamic copy out of it. Then, after doing the copying, I'm going to copy every individual item out of that one into this one. So everything gets copied into the new one. Now that it's copied, I'm going to copy the size and make it 7. And then after that, the first one dies and goes away. And the second one dies and goes away. And each one have their thing. No memory leak and everything is beautiful. Ta-da! OK? That was deep copying. That was the copy constructor you create.
Are we okay with this? Copy assignment. Now, copy assignment is even more important. Why? Because copy assignment needs, it has one extra step that the copy constructor doesn't have. With copy assignment, you are not creating a new object. You already have an object with data of its own. So you have to make sure before you do the copying between the two, you take care of the data of the other one. So the very first step you do is to delete the data of the target. That's the only extra thing you do in here. The rest is exactly like copy assignment. That is why when you are doing rule of three, in copy constructor, you call the assignment operator. Because if you set everything to null in the, cons in the definition of the class, then all the data is null. If it deletes null, nothing happens. So it could work for both of them. That saves time. So most of the places that you see, they just make sure everything is null, and they call the, the assignment operator. But assignment, the rest of it is exactly the same. Now the rest is exactly the same with absolutely no difference with copy construction. The only additional thing is to take care of already existing data. Are we okay? Dynamic memory allocation is reviewed. That's the end of it. Please, please go watch that video, the review. I think one of the students was kind enough to give timeline for each topic. So if you, I think if you go over there in that review session, I think one of the students who was over there in the, let me see if, it, if they did it. They actually, so if I, they didn't? Oh, shoot. Okay, it's not here. Anyways, uh, I thought that somebody actually said at this, uh, um, Nah. No, it's not. I thought they actually put uh, time tags, that at this time it's this one. So go through that. It's, it's, it's good if you go through it. You can skip forward. But the sequence of things uh, mentioned is exactly the sequence of the code. So if you look at the sequence of the code, that's what it is. So if you look at the sequence of the code in here, you, you, you can expect approximately where it's going to be. You can fast forward it. So if you go to the code over here, uh, when you see always it says operators and it comes down over here and it goes to pointers and stuff like that. So if you want pointers, you can just skip forward and get to pointers to see what is pointer and so, so on and so forth. All right, so dynamic memory allocation was that. Uh, member functions, we know what it is. I don't think there's any review required for member functions. I'll be okay with it. Everybody's okay with it by now, I hope. Uh, uh, construction, destruction, we know exactly what it is. The only thing that I want to point to is that we have, uh, did I talk about the universal way of initialization? Universal, universal in C++? In C++, there is a universal way of initializing things, which means, for example, if I want that val to get initialized to its default value, all I need to do is do like this in front of it. That makes it zero. You don't need to write equal to zero. Open bracket, curly, close curly bracket, defaults whatever you have. If you have a pointer, you want to set it to null. If you have a pointer, you want to like, let's say I have a class over here class student, and I have character pointer name. I want the name to be null. That's all I need to do. Then I have integer student number. Oh, that's wrong. M name, M student number. If I want that to be zero, I do this. Then I'm going to say double M GPA. I'm going to do that. That becomes zero. It sets everything zero. The good thing about this is that in all constructors, they're all going to be zero. You don't need to worry about setting anything to zero in constructors. So say I have a constructor over here that's, that, that builds a student with a name. So in here I have student. That's the default constructor, right? And then I have student, constant character pointer name, and 
say, uh, M student number. Let's say I want to create it like that, so I'm going to go integer student number. Okay? First of all, because my default constructor, my, do I need to have a default constructor? Everything is already set to zero, right? No default constructor is needed, correct? But if I create a constructor, I have to manually create the default constructor because the system won't create it, right? There are two ways of doing it. Either make it empty, create an empty default constructor, or write this magical thing. It means I know that I created other constructors. Please create the empty default constructor for me. It does it for you. And everything's going to be fine anyway because you did it in, a, in the definition of the class and everything was set to zero. But that type of def, uh, uh, creation, uh, that type of uh, uh, in, uh, initialization, it is really uh, universal. Just take a look. Say, let me just clap, collapse these. So let's say I want to create a student. If I come over here and say student s, okay, student s. If I do like this, it creates it defa its default constructor, correct? If I do this, it's a default constructor too. If I want to create a student with name and student number, I can actually do this. Works the same way. So instead, so you can use curly bracket instead of parentheses. It works. If I have an array of integers, I can say integer a uh, two, 300. I can do this. It sets the first two to one and two, and the rest will be zero. If I want them all to be zero, I'll go integer a c 4,000, and I do like that. And they're all going to be null. OK? If I want to create an array of students, let's say I have another constructor for a student that only accepts a student number and no name. I can do this. I can say student s to um, a. <laughs> Let's say 100 students, and I want the first one to be 1, 2, 3, 4 with the student number, and second one to be 5, 5, 5, 5. So the first two students will be using the constructor with single argument, and the rest will be all defaulted. It's a universal way of initializing things with curly brackets. Got it? All right? So you don't need to write integer pointer Character pointer name is equal to null PTR. You don't need to do that. Just put the curly bracket. It's, it defaults it automatically. Are we good? So that's construction, destruction. Current object, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the address of the current object. Target of this is the object itself. Store this, right? Target of this. Don't, uh, for pointers, please use this lingo. For pointers, use this lingo. This is type pointer. It's not type star. Type pointer. Star belongs to type, not PTR. You see many places they write this. That's wrong. Star belongs to integer because together they mean integer pointer. It's a new type. It's not an integer. It's an integer pointer. So P is an unsigned integer holding an address of an integer. Are we good? So star belongs to type. Together they call pointer. So this is called integer pointer. Correct? Right? Next thing. Ah, I wish. Let me write it. Next thing, so in here, what is this? This is so 
So the next thing, uh, so if I say, if I say, that's student pointer p, correct? When I say over here, or I do this, so the lingo over here. Line number 15, p is set to the address of a new student. Do we understand this? P is set to the address of a new student, right? This one is target of P pointer. P is set to A. Target of pointer P. Don't say asterisk P. Target of P. It means not the P itself, what it's pointing to. Got it? That is, P is set to address of A, not ampersand A. Address of A. If you don't say it right, it won't fit. Okay, so <clears throat> how do you read this? Can somebody read that in English for me? E is set to M multiplied by target of C multiplied by target of C. As a result, we know that C is a pointer. Got it? You see lots of asterisks over there, it kind of becomes confusing, correct? It's not. Remember, when asterisks don't make sense, that's target of. When asterisk is awkward, what the hell is that? Whenever you feel that, that's target of. When asterisk makes sense, it's multiplication. When asterisk comes after a type, it belongs to the type, and it's a pointer. That's, by the way, in, is in IPC 144 review. All right. Say it right, then it would fit right. This is not CPP. This was C. It has nothing to do with C++. Uh, member operator, class plus... Class, so class plus resources and all the good stuff, good stuff we talked about. I don't need to go through it. Member operators. <clears throat> operators are nothing. Operators are nothing but functions. Operator overload is nothing but function. Don't give it extra credit. It can be just called in two different ways, using the function name or something else. Like, for example, Let's say I want to add to the value of GPA of a student. What do I do? Student reference operator plus equal double value 
and in here I'm going to say m gpa plus equal value and return this. Obviously, why did I do this? Oper so in and in here I can say if m gpa plus value is less than or equal to 4.0. We cannot have anybody more than 4.0, correct? That's why we wrote the operator plus equal, all right? Now, if I want to run that program, student s, I can say an, I can say a is equal to s plus equal, say, 1.2, correct? That's how the thing is called. So it adds 1.2 to the GPA of S and passes S to A. Are we good? All right. But I could have called this one like this too. These two lines are identical. These two lines are identical. I just use the function name. It's a function, right? It's a method. I could do that. You will never, ever create or overload an operator as a helper function if you don't have to. Got it? You should never, ever, ever create an operator of overload as a helper function unless you have to. How do you have to? When do you have to? Number one, left side is not a class. If I want to be able to do this, so I'm going to say, for example, uh, double total, and I want to say total is equal to total plus A. So I add the GPA of that one to this one. Let's make that one zero. Now you know what is line 22 doing, right? Double is zero now. I initialize it to zero, universal initialization, right? So I want to add, I want to be able to get the GPA of a student plus what I have in total and add it to another thing, something like that. Or, um, yeah, something like that, right? How can I do that? At left side, I have a double. At right side, I have a student. I can't make the plus to be a member of total. That cannot be done. Because it can't be done, I have to do it as a helper. So I have to say double operator plus double and at right side constant student reference s. Correct? Now, how do I give access to this GPA to student? Awful way of doing it is to make it a friend. So in here, I can now say, oh, and that double is, or, so I'm going to say return value plus equal s dot mgpa. This will work, but it's an awful thing to do. I just, yes. One more time. Friend is awful. Friend is for knife in the back. You will never use, I just gave an example for it of not to do. What not? Yeah, exactly. I can change the name. I can, it's a bad thing to do. Very, very bad thing to do. I shouldn't do that. So what do you need to do? So that's an awful way of doing it. We are not doing that. For this case, what we are going to do over here is to create a Accessor. So in here, I'm going to create double GPA, and I'm going to make it constant under supervision. I'm going to return the GPA. So this function returns the GPA without letting anybody make making any change to to the class. Oh, 
right? And now, instead of this gibberish that I have written, I'm going to simply say GPA. The results are all the same, and I do not have a friend. That's when you create a helper. When the left side is not a class. Or the left side is a class, but you don't have access to its source code. For example, what if I want to create print a student? If I want to print a student, I want to be able to say, see out A and L. I want to be able to print the student. I can't. Can I go change ice stream? No, I don't want to. So what do I do? And this is completely standard. All the things, all, this, all the C out overloads are like, done like this. First of all, you create a function with this signature. O stream, operator O stream, and call it something. Write, print, I don't know, output, whatever you call it. I'm going to call it print. And you pass an O stream reference to it, OSDR. That is assigned to a defaulted C out. So they can actually call the print without any arguments, and automatically it's printed on C out. By default, if you don't provide argument for it, it will be C out. Then using this, you're going to print the, and you have to make sure it's constant, so nothing is changed in the class. Now what do we do? We're going to say, for example, OSTR, uh, name, name of the student, and uh, I'm going to have, say, a comma, student number, and, sorry, M name, my apologies, my apologies, M name, M student number, <clears throat> and then I'm going to print, uh, what am I going to print? Uh, say a, a, a parentheses, and in here I'm going to say M student number, and close parentheses. And do this only if M name is available. Otherwise, the class is invalid. So I can actually say over here, else, OSDR invalid student object. Right? And at the end, I'm going to return OSDR. So first, you cre create a print function that has that signature. Then you create a helper function that flows through the print and passes everything out. So the next thing you do, and this one, you need to do it with your eyes closed. O stream, reference, operator, left shift, then O stream, reference, OSDR, and at right side, const, student, reference, S. And in here, all you need to do is to say, return s dot s dot print passing osdr to it and done so when somebody in the program does c out a it calls this one because at left side it has c out at right side it has a so it calls this function and this function calls the print and print prints everything why did we create it? Why did we create this print thingy over here? So we can use the print with many different children of O stream. One of the children of O stream is O F stream, right? O F stream is something that you can create a file with, correct? So what I could do is simply come to my application in here and say, for example, O F stream file std.txt, for example, that's my student, and in here I'm going to say of, uh, uh, fstream. Now I'm going to come down in here, and now I can actually say a.print, and in here say file. So it's going to print in std.txt. Or even I can say c out file. Oh, sorry. Either I can say file A and L. Why? Because file is child of 
C out. Anything C out knows, file knows, inheritance. And automatically it's going to pick up the proper, print, the proper output. A proper output for C out is to print on a screen. A proper output for file is to print it in a file. That's polymorphism that we're going to learn how to implement later. But we can use it now, implement it later. Okay? So these are beautiful stuff that you can do. All right? So that's that. With operator overloading reviewed, to the bone, the next thing we have derived classes that we are going to teach the next time you're coming in. So the review is over. Any questions? The next time you're coming in, we're going to do inheritance. I'm going to go through everything, through what I call animal kingdom. I created something with animals and stuff like that, so I teach it, teach it using that. <clears throat> I strongly suggest the next time you're coming in, read that uh, inheritance part and keep going. You don't need to understand it. I don't want you to master it. Before you go to sleep, just open it up and just read it. Okay? These are the things you are reading the next day you are coming in. So let me just go through the... So, oh gosh, don't tell me I have to... Oh. I have to familiarize myself with Black. Blackboard cha got changed last semester to the new one. That's why it's taking some time for me to go through all the things. Okay, I'm going to familiarize myself and set them up. But uh, so go to your <coughs> courses. We are ZAA, right? So, all right. Uh, and. Weekly schedule, open it up. So these are, well, seriously? Okay, so derived classes, function is hierarchy, virtual classes, abstract based classes, week eight and nine. I'll read it all. Okay, just read it. You do not need to understand it. You do not need to, you may get some idea out of it. But just go through it. Because when I start, I keep going. And it's very possible I go right up to virtual functions. And I even go to teach the virtual functions the next, uh, the next time you're coming in. So be aware of that. Remember I told you I'm going to teach. And suddenly you'll see that I, I went through two weeks on one session. That's what I was talking about. Any questions? You have a difficult weekend. OK? I want you to review all the things. I tried to go through the beginning of the semester uh, the best I could in these two sessions. Uh, please go through uh, uh, the IPC 144 review before you come in very quickly. Take a look at, let's put it this way, the code that I have written. Look at the code. If you see the code I've written, you cannot explain it, then watch the video for it. Otherwise. And you have to find the video somewhere. I don't uh, find the video because it's like a nine-hour video. <laughs> you have to somehow find out what it is, and that's a tough one. But I would look at it, I would look at it uh, if I were you. It's, it's good for your health. Anyway, so uh, let me stop the recording. Actually, before I do that, any questions? Suggestions? Are we okay? We're all good? All right. All right. Okay. I think I'm losing my voice and something is going wrong with my, because uh, 